Good afternoon, everyone. Good to see you. My name is Pastor Ryan. I'm one of the pastors here at St. John Lutheran. We had a wonderful uh, procession from Corinthian Baptist, and uh, fortunately, that half mile is all downhill. <laughs> we didn't quite have the donkeys, but the weather cleared up pretty nicely. So uh, welcome to you. Uh, glad to have you here um, by way of orientation, bathrooms, if anyone needs them, pretty much uh, out the hallway and to your left in this corner. Feel free to use them and um, we will get going with the service shortly. We begin with the land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that this land on which we are gathered this afternoon is the traditional ancestral tr land of the Iowa Nation, whose ancestors are today the Iowa Tribe of Kansas and Nebraska and the Iowa Tribe of Oklahoma and of the Meskwaki Nation. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have stewarded it throughout the generations. We believe that we are called to be better stewards of this land. Amen to that. Our service continues with the call to worship. And you can see the call and response in your bulletin. The response is in bold. We give thanks to you, O beloved, for you are kind. Your steadfast love endures forever. Let every nation proclaim your steadfast love endures forever. Let all the people cry, your steadfast love endures forever. Let those who reverence you sing, your steadfast love endures forever. Our opening hymn is Children of the Heavenly Father, number six, excuse me, 781 in your Cranberry Hymnal. Please join in the responsive opening prayer. Shout and cheer, children. Raise your voices, siblings. Look at who has arrived. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Rather than a war horse surrounded by armies, we see a humble servant riding on a donkey, inviting us to follow. We wave our branches and spread our clothes on the road to make way for the one who brings peace. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. We have had. 
at it with war and destruction. There will be no more chariots in Ephraim, no more war horses in Jerusalem, no more tanks or fighter jets or battleships, no more swords and spears, bows and arrows, no more assault rifles, suitcase bombs, or drone strikes. We welcome the one who will bring peace to all nations, whose peaceful rule will stretch across creation from four winds to the seven seas. Shout and cheer and be filled with hope. It is a great honor for me to introduce my friend of 30 years, Pastor Christine Cowan, to those of you who have not met her. I know I'm going to embarrass her, but that's okay. Uh, she will eventually forgive me. I hope. Chris is, in my opinion, a Renaissance woman. She plays guitar. She leads choirs, at least in, in prior to her retirement. She preaches. She was a nurse. She is a fabulous land, uh, excuse me, landscape painter, uh, and she's a dear friend. We are both members of Bethesda Lutheran Church in Ames, Iowa. In my opinion, she is among the most, if not the most, well-known, at least in Lutheran circles in the Southeastern Iowa Synod, and in other circles as well for her knowledge of Israel, Palestine, Gaza, and the West Bank. In addition to her understanding what is going on in that tortured land, her compassion is equal to her ability and grasp of the issues. I'm honored to, to be the one to introduce her. Thank you, committee, for that honor. If you are able, please stand for the reading of today's gospel reading. It comes to us from the 11th chapter of St. Mark, beginning verse 1. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the village ahead of you and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this, the Lord needs it and it will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They told them that Jesus had said what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it back. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple 
And when he had looked around at everything as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. The Gospel of the Lord. Pray for you, O Christ. You may be seated. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I want to thank the people who invited me to speak. I want to say aw shucks to my friend Russ uh, <clears throat> and to the rest of you. I want you to hear my prayer, oh God help me now, because Pastor Russ has set a very high bar. Uh, I also want to say to you a couple of words about what I'm about to do. I'm going to talk for a while, then we're going to sing a little, and then I'm going to talk some more. And the words that you will be able to join in with me on are in your bulletin. We'll get to that point in a bit. I also want to say that I was invited to give a sermon, but it was advertised as a keynote. So I looked up keynote because I'm accustomed to preaching for 12 minutes. And it said, keynotes average 45 minutes to an hour. <laughs> so what you're going to get is kind of a hybrid. And I just invite you to take it at a casual pace. If you have to get up and get a drink, go ahead. If you need to use the facilities, go ahead. All I ask is that if you all leave at once, you leave me a little note saying what coffee shop you went to. And now may the Lord, uh, <clears throat> may the Lord uh, bless our ponderings today as we ponder this scripture and what it has to do with our current events. Riding into Jerusalem on that donkey on that first Palm Sunday, Jesus knew he was fulfilling prophecies, and so did the people. In riding into Jerusalem on a donkey, Jesus knew the people would see him as the heir to David's throne by divine right. Because in the Old Testament book of 1 Kings, priests placed young Solomon on King David's donkey as a preparation for anointing him the next king. Jesus also knew the prophecy in the book of Zechariah, and so did the people. Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Proclaim, daughter of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. Righteous and a savior is he. Humble and riding on a donkey. According to that prophecy, the coming king would do away with the war horse, do away with the chariot, do away with the battle bow, and he would save the people and command peace to the nations. The people knew that prophecy too. So as Jesus entered Jerusalem, they cried out, Hosanna, which is a Hebrew word that literally means, oh God, help us now. It means save us, as we can see in Psalm 118. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. So we're basically overwhelmed with prophecies here. The crowd waved palm branches, remembering the celebration less than 200 years before, when the Maccabees were finally able to enter the holy city after successfully cleansing Jerusalem of the Seleucid occupiers. Now, once again, living under occupation, this time Roman, the Palm Sunday crowd remembered, and so they waved their palms as a sign that they were ready and they were eager to crown Jesus the King and to acclaim him as their savior. They had high hopes for him. They expected great things from him, mighty things, military things. That is what they expected. Now Jerusalem was crowded with pilgrims for Passover at that time. 
Some scholars have suggested that maybe that week, the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, who probably spent most of his time at Caesarea Maritima along the Mediterranean because of the cool breezes, right? That he would have ridden into Jerusalem in his chariot that week, accompanied by a cohort of Roman soldiers in full battle gear as a demonstration of the force of Rome and the rule of Caesar. And so, you see, in that context, Jesus entering Jerusalem in a parade with a crowd acclaiming him king was a provocative political statement. It was subversive. The Palm Sunday parade was dangerous. For Jesus, surrounded by the cheering crowd in what must have been quite a spectacle, it was probably a very lonely road because Jesus knew he wasn't called to lead an army into Jerusalem, and he wasn't called to overthrow Rome. His would not be a military rule. The kingdom he was to inaugurate was a different sort of reign. Instead of a kingdom in the traditional sense, it was a kingdom, one we would find hard to grasp and even harder to live into. Jesus, you see, he knew us. He knew us. He saw us as we are. He saw through us. He saw how little faith and how little hope and how little love we actually have. He knew his disciples would deny him and desert him and betray him despite their best intentions to be heroes and to follow him anywhere at whatever cost they would walk away from him in his hour of deepest need. Jesus knew that his crown on earth would be made of thorn, and his throne would be the hard wood of a cross. And he knew that human history would continue to be haunted by war. So knowing all that he knew, why didn't Jesus just say, ah, the hell with it? <coughs> what kept him going down that Palm Sunday road? Jesus could have walked away and lived a very different life. But Jesus chose to honor and obey the calling he had from God. Because knowing all that he knew, Jesus also saw us with the divine eyes. He saw us as children of his heavenly Father, children who were broken and helpless and in need, children stumbling around in the dark. Jesus saw you and me and the people that surrounded him, the people in the crowds, even the Romans, through eyes of love, and so he resolutely went forward on that lonely road to his final teachings and his suffering into what became what we know as Holy Week. I believe that God, who made us in God's image, still sees us through eyes of love. Can I get an amen to that? Amen. All right. And I believe that God still recognizes God's image upon the face of humanity, despite everything we have subjected one another to over the ages. Sisters and brothers, that steadfast, divine love is no small thing. We know it. That's why we're here. There is no person on the face of this earth that God does not love. And now we get to the crux of the matter. Because that would mean there is no Israeli, no Palestinian, no Gazan, no member of the Shin Bet, no member of Hamas, no Russian, no Ukrainian. In short, no human being at all, no
no matter how much we might fear them, no matter how much we are tempted to stereotype or loathe them, there is no human being that God does not love. Not one soul, not one soul that Jesus did not ride down that Palm Sunday road for. This is the understanding Jesus came to demonstrate in his daily living, in his death, and in his resurrection. The peace he offers is a peace based on relationships. He gives us peace with God, does he not? And we have mutual care and respect for all people because of that peace that he has given us. It is because of that peace that we can engage in the radical behavior that is known as forgiveness, the radical offering that is known as a second chance. As members of Jesus' kingdom, we are called to love one another as he loved us steadfastly. But just as Jesus was rejected, his teaching of the kinship of all people is rejected among us time and again. <clears throat> now, Jesus knew there would be opposition to his teaching. That's why he told us, be wise as serpents and be guileless as doves. To be wise as serpents, to have our eyes open to see and our ears open to hear what is really going on around us and innocent as doves. Think, one, think no one harm. Wish no one harm. Do no one harm. When we pay attention, we see that we humans often do not seek peace through loving the other. We're too afraid for that. We're too impatient for that. It is too costly. It is not expedient. Instead, we seek peace the old Roman way, through, co through coercion. In Jesus' time, the Romans would dominate an area by strength of arms. They would occupy it by force. They would kill, imprison, or enslave any who objected. And then they would maintain peace by continuous shows of military force. This kind of peace, which was known as the Pax Romana, should sound familiar. It's the way the world has been settling its differences since time immemorial. Now, I have several close relatives who have served in the armed forces. And I honor them for their service but I myself never joined up. My first career was nursing, and when a nurse graduates, especially if they graduate as a first career, so they are young, they get courted by all branches of the military on a regular basis, and I was so courted every year for decades. But I could not get my head around the idea of war. Back then, I didn't really know much about war. Before I went to Palestine and Israel, words like occupation and blockade, they were just war words. But then when I went to the West Bank, first to Bethlehem, then to Jerusalem, and then to the South Hebron Hills, and then to some of the other rural areas, I saw what occupation looks like. Occupation looks like a child in a refugee camp who stuck his head out the window to see what was going on and was shot and died. Military incursions by the occupying country into neighborhoods are common in occupations. Occupation looks like a woman I met as she stood in the rubble of her demolished home. I went up to her through an interpreter 
told her how sorry I was that her home had been demolished by the military, but she didn't want to talk about the demolition. This did not interest her. Instead, she begged me for information about her two young sons, who six months prior had been arrested in the dead of night out of their beds when soldiers broke into the home. About her sons, she had had no news these six months. Did I know where her sons were? Could I please find out? Defense for Children International has documented that on any given day, five to 700 children are held in Israeli military detention in conditions that UNICEF has described as torture. Occupation has names and faces, and the stories go on and on and on. Occupation looks like the newborn infant who died of suffocation in his crib because Israelis tear-gassed the whole neighborhood. Occupation looks like a young man named Harun who lived in a village that, that the occupation did not allow to have access to electricity. So they had, the family had rented a generator. But the military did not want the family to have a generator, and so soldiers came to take it away. In the scuffle that ensued, an Israeli soldier shot Harun in the neck at point blank range, and he was made a quadriplegic. Soldiers did not allow the ambulance to take him to the hospital. It took a long time for him to get to health care. <clears throat> the Israeli government would not pay any hospitalization fees, and the Palestinian Authority also would not pay hospitalization fees because his care required him to be treated in a tertiary care center in Israel. That's what occupation looks like. Occupation looks like Suleiman, a venerable old man who was dragged to his death by a vehicle during an Israeli military incursion in his village. I could go on and on with these examples. The occupation of the Palestinian territories is so grievous that in 2009, Palestinian church leaders got together and wrote a document called the Kairos Document, which called the occupation a sin against God and humanity, which faithful followers of Christ must oppose. That was in 2009. <clears throat> occupation has an evil twin, blockade, which is considered an act of war under international law. Gaza has been under complete blockade for over 16 years. And even before the war broke out, the current war, for there have been many, none like this. Even before that, in 2020, the United Nations stated that Gaza was considered uninhabitable because it had almost no drinking water and 80% of the population were living in poverty. Now, a complete blockade is a form of siege, which in extreme cases leads to famine of human origin. For this reason, in order for a blockade to be legal in international law, humanitarian aid must be given free protected passage into the territory to protect the civilian population. The blockade of Gaza had already created nearly uninhabitable conditions in 2020, according to the UN, and look at it now. Occupation, blockade, war. The words we use matter. The word war brings to mind an armed struggle between armies of somewhat equal status. Israel has one of the strongest armies in the world. Whereas most of the Palestinian people, having lived under occupation since 1967, 
other than the Hamas militants, are unarmed. So I want to ask you what do you call it when a combatant has their boot on the neck of the other combatant? Do you call that war? If something like that happened in a schoolyard, we would call it bullying. When it happens on the street, we call it assault. As for what is happening now in Gaza, Hamas on October 7th found a way through the security fence into Israel, attacking civilians at a music concert and raiding several towns and kibbutzim around the border of Gaza. Hamas militants attacked men, women, and children. They did not restrict themselves to military targets. They killed over 1,200 Israelis, and these men, women, and children have faces and names and grieving relatives. Hamas took around 250 hostages into Gaza, whoever they could grab, some of whom have been released, some of whom have died in captivity, and some who are still captives. And these also have faces and names and deeply anxious families. I will stand here before you and say, in answer to the question of whether Hamas's attack was unprovoked, I will say Hamas's attack was not unprovoked. After 38 years of occupation of that territory and, in addition, 16 years of blockade that were all endured by the Gaza Strip's residents. What Hamas did that day is protected in, his, in international law in that they resisted occupation by force of arms. This is legal. But how they resisted as terrorists attacking civilians was a war, war crime. And we don't condone or explain away this behavior. The perpetrators need to be held accountable. I don't see anybody going for coffee yet. Thank you for your attention. Now, all nations have a right to defend themselves from attack, and that includes the nation of Israel. But as the occupier of Gaza, Israel has a firm responsibility under the Fourth Geneva Convention to protect the civilian population there. This is a responsibility that the government of Israel has ignored. The Israeli government's response has been described as disproportionate and collective punishment. Both words are true, but they're not sufficient. The United Nations has reported that now over 32,000 Gazans have died in this war. Over 17,000 children no longer have a parent or caretaker with them. More than half of those that were killed were women and children, and these statistics do not count those that are buried in the rubble. 250 Israeli soldiers have also died in the fighting. This is a ratio of 128 dead Palestinian civilians. Well, we don't know they're all civilians. But 128 dead Palestinians to one dead Israeli. 128 to one. The Israeli military has also blocked humanitarian aid missions at least 26 times, has shelled aid trucks from the sea, has opened fire on hungry Gazans as they approached aid trucks. At the present moment, Gaza is on the brink of a strategically, deliberately engineered famine. Gazan civilians are being intentionally starved to death. I saw a woman in a video who, when she was given a piece of bread, burst into tears, saying she had not tasted bread in two months. People in the north part of Gaza have been grind grinding animal feed and mixing it with grass to have something, anything, to feed their families. One in 13 of infants and young children that were evaluated by WHO teams in the north part of Gaza, one out of 13 
were found to have severe acute malnutrition, and at least 27 infants and children have starved to death. I could go on, but I think you know many of these things. I think you're attending to the news, or you would not be here. I would like to ask you what words you use to describe this. The word war is insufficient. The mildest word I can think of is massacre. Some would call it state terrorism. Some have taken the long view and have called it the ongoing ethnic cleansing of Palestine, in Arabic, the ongoing Nakba. The International Court of Justice has called it plausible genocide. Now, I want to be clear about that. In order for the International Court of Justice to give a final determination of genocide, it takes years, years. In South Africa, when they brought the case against Israel, when they brought the case to the International Court of Justice, they weren't asking for a final ruling. They weren't asking for permission to use that word. What they were saying is, if genocide is plausible, can we stop Israel from continuing to do it? Can we give them provisional rules to follow in order to prevent genocide. And that is what the court did. Brothers and sisters, I have to tell you that since the date of the International Court of Justice's ruling, over 5,000 more Gazans have been killed. In the name of self-defense and a plan to destroy all of Hamas, which is likely to be impossible to accomplish, the bombing goes on and on, and just as with Hamas, whose perpetrators on October 7th must be held responsible, these perpetrators also must be held responsible. In the face of this indescribable cruelty, which is what we see when we pay attention, following Jesus' admonition to be wise as serpents. In the face of this, many people of goodwill feel overwhelmed. I would like to see a show of hands. How many of you have felt overwhelmed? Yes. And some of us, for a time, stunned into silence. After all, we're small, what can we do? We live far away, what can we do? We live in a place where binary thinking is pervasive and you're either on a one side or on the other side and then they'll know whether to like you or not. Then they'll know whether to listen to you or not. People want to know whose side you're on. And so we who follow Christ and realize that the image of God is present in every human soul in our overwhelm, may be tempted to choose to say nothing, thinking that's the safe course. It's complicated. And if we're silent, we won't offend anybody, right? But silence does offend, brothers and sisters. Silence cries out to heaven because it gives consent to the aggressor. It empowers the perpetrator. If the leaders were all silent in this instance, the rule of international law would be undermined to the point of making it irrelevant. And if international law that protects us all becomes irrelevant, there will be indescribable costs on a historic and global scale. So I contend that people of goodwill must speak and we must act. There must be a ceasefire yesterday. There must be a ceasefire. There must be a ceasefire. There must be an end 
to the evils of this war, and there must be accountability. But, brothers and sisters, may our speech and our actions be seasoned with love as we are advised by the words of our Savior as he taught us, would-be peacemakers must be both wise as serpents and as innocent as doves. So we begin with wisdom, which turns away from binary thinking and looks for another way of thinking about things. It looks with empathy into the root causes of the suffering and the, and, and the effects of that suffering. We see that in the background of the actions of both Hamas and Israel, there is trauma and there is fear. After years of occupation and blockade and periodic, periodic bombings, years of hungering for food and water and hungering for freedom of movement and self-determination and hungering for access to the larger world, years of hunger for hope and quality of life, Palestinians in Gaza are traumatized and Israelis are traumatized. They thought their government would keep them safe, and then it didn't. The attack on October 7th by Hamas reactivated generational trauma related to centuries of persecution pogroms, and the Holocaust. Trauma. When attacked, the Israeli government fought back. They responded with bombing. The deepest need of every human being is for safety and security, and this need has not been met for either party. Trauma responses. How many of you know your trauma responses? Fight, flight, freeze. There may be others, but we can pay attention to these three because they're not entirely conscious. They emerge out of what is known as the reptilian brain, that central part of the brain that is responsible for, keeping, for helping us survive, right? Once we feel safer, then we can start to process in the in the processing parts of our brain, what is happening with the goal of seeking and choosing a further response, something a little more creative. This might be one of the best arguments and one that I have not heard yet for advocating for an enduring ceasefire on both sides and a release of both hostages and political prisoners. It might make for a sense of safety and security and allow for a more creative thought process. Wisdom also recognizes the weight of collective grief. Brothers and sisters, we must not forget the role of lamentation. I confess that I cannot cry tears very easily anymore. But I can use words like heartbroken to describe the feeling, tone of this ongoing war I have heard people that have been active in this say, I shut down for weeks. We need to find space to lament. I have friends and relatives that choose not to listen to the news at all. They consciously avoid knowing what we know. They don't read my posts on Facebook. They've told me. I have to block that out. I have to protect myself from seeing what you've seen and hearing what you've heard. I can't bear that sorrow. This is a trauma response. It's called flight. How many of you have taken breaks from the war? Okay. It's self-protection, right? When I was an ecumenical accompanier with the World Council of Churches and we got ready to come back home, they told us, this is a marathon not a sprint. You need to take breaks. Otherwise, you won't still be in it for the long haul. So I take breaks. No apologies. But my friends that are suffering the agonies of war in the West Bank, their voices are in my ears. Their posts are in my Facebook feed. Please don't leave us alone. 
Please don't leave us alone. Please don't leave us alone. Love listens, love sees, love accompanies. Love accompanies. Let's take a little time for lamentation. We're going to sing a bit. that I learned at the Churches for Middle East Peace Conference in 2019, which was called And Still We Rise, and brought uh, Palestinian human rights activists from various locations in the Middle East. So we get a chance to hear what they were doing, what heroic things they were doing for peace. And the Egyptian church has this song, which is called Salam, Salam being the Arabic word for peace. I'm going to teach you the refrain, and then I'm going to sing verses, and you can sing the refrain with me, OK? Salam, Salam. Try that. Salam, salam, the peace of God to every race. Same tune. Salam, salam, the peace of Every 
fear, grief, and anger. Salam also to our enemies. It's a prayer that needs some practice, isn't it? When we have been hurt, we tend to think what goes around comes around, and perhaps unconsciously, to hope that these people will get what's coming to them. But revenge is not one of the things that make for peace, as Jesus knew and taught us. Not to seek an eye for an eye, but to love our enemies, pray for them, and do good to them. Now, not all anger involves a desire for revenge. Wisdom recognizes the value of anger, and that's good news to me because the attacks on civilians in the West Bank and in Gaza and in Israel leave me not just grieving, but enraged. What to do with that anger? In the book of Ephesians, we're told, be angry, but do not sin. That is to say, there is a way to be angry that is not sinful, that does not seek revenge. That is the narrow way. Jesus demonstrated it for us. Today, you heard, he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, and then he got off, and he walked into the temple, and he looked around, and then he went back to Bethany and Bethphage, and he rested. He rested. He took some time to pray and process what he had seen. And the next day he went back to Jerusalem and he drove out the buyers and the sellers out of the temple. He overturned the tables of the money changers. He exercised a kind of anger against a system that was doing injustice in the name of his father. Now, we often call such anger righteous indignation, and it is, in fact, a sin not to experience righteous indignation in the face of massive injustice. In righteous indignation, it doesn't exact revenge, but it rebukes injustice, and it does not allow it to continue unchecked. What would Jesus see in the Holy Land today? What would Jesus see in Washington today? What would Jesus say? What would he do? Are we angry at what we see happening in the Holy Land and in Washington? Now, brothers and sisters, I've experienced anger as a form of energy, right? You get really mad, don't you have that energy? Don't you feel like you got to do something with it? Punching bag, right? Okay. How do we use that energy? How do we use it for good? Can we mine it? Can we refine it? Maybe raw anger is a little bit like the garbage I put in the outside bin. In its raw state, trust me, it stinks. But give it a little heat, a few micro microbes. Give it some time, allow it to process a little while, and it becomes compost, and that's useful, right? So what would anger look like if its energy was refined and processed into something good? Well, it looked like Jesus turning over the tables of injustice. Processed anger, especially when refined in a community with other people of goodwill, is a form of energy that empowers creative, nonviolent responses to evil. So the system that the Israeli government imposes on the Palestinian people is one of separate and unequal. And it is one in which Israeli people and Palestinian people are not encouraged to spend time with one another. They are not encouraged to get to know one another on the human level. Remember when I told you about Harun, the young man who was trying to protect the family generator and became a quadriplegic? Remember that story? 
My friend Erella is a member of an Israeli human rights organization called the Villages Group. When she found out about Harun, she was horrified because she had been, ever since, ever since forever, for decades, she had decided her government did not have the right to tell her who to care about, who to befriend. And so for decades, she devoted herself to leaving the kibbutz with some of her friends that had processed some of their anger at what their government was trying to do, and going into the villages of the rural Palestinian people and befriending them, and helping them with their needs and providing them with things that they couldn't otherwise get, like summer camps for the kids, right? They would fundraise and they would do all these, these human rights kind of things to show their solidarity with the people suffering under occupation. So Arella actually knew Harun before this horrible thing happened to him. And she and the other members of the Villages group devoted months of their lives to this family. They devoted themselves to international fundraising because neither the Palestinian nor the Israeli government would pay for his medical care, which was costing an astronomical amount of money because he was in intensive care and then he was in intensive care rehab for months. <clears throat> they dug deep, they fundraised, they brought family back and forth to the hospital. This is what processed anger looks like. When he was finally able to go home, they fundraised for a special wheelchair and got physical therapists and occupational therapists and nurses 24-7 to help this family. That is what processed anger looks like. Processed anger looks like members of Jewish Voice for Peace occupying the Statue of Liberty. Did you know they did that? They did that, 500 of them and about 300 got arrested because they wanted to make a statement, don't bomb Gaza in our name. Processed anger, refined anger. It looks like persistent prayer. It looks like persistent advocacy. It looks like persistent nonviolent demonstrations for peace that fill the streets and require people to pay attention, as is now happening all over the world. This kind of anger insists on being heard. Refined anger does not wait for the universe to bend toward justice, but gets a few of its friends and works on bending it. All right. Processed anger, refined anger, it organizes people because we know that we're small and we're just one person, but we don't have to be one person. We can learn that we are a common people, commonly grieving, commonly infuriated about injustice. Refined anger calls a swamp a swamp, but then goes and walks the halls of Congress anyway because refined anger believes change is possible. And can I get an amen to that? Amen. 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 All right. Brothers and sisters, if we are to be true followers of the humble man who rode on that donkey into Jerusalem to take his place as the ruler of the kingdom of God, then we must let ourselves become wise as serpents we must keep watch with those who are enduring the hell of war. We must educate ourselves to the realities of the time, and we must be innocent as doves. We wish none harm. We think none harm. We do none harm. Our responses are seasoned with love. We must let ourselves feel our grief and find ways to express it. And our actions need to be powered by that righteous indignation at the injustice, and they need to be organized for change, working together creatively for a better future. And finally, do justice, love mercy, and finally walk humbly because we are not God.
None of us sees the whole picture. None of us can do everything. Each of us can do something. But then you all know all of that, right? May you have God's peace. Thank you for listening. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Cowan. Would you join in the litany of peace with me written in your bulletin? We'll join together on those first bold words. War begins when we harden our hearts. We tighten our grip on our truth. We have something to prove. We are too tired to find another way. Help us to recognize ourselves in the violence of others. Help us to do the work of letting go of our own anger and despair. Help us to be faithful and help us to pray. Amen. Amen. Well, first of all, I'd like to say thank you, Pastor Cowan. Uh, I've heard you speak before. You deliver a very powerful witness, a Christian witness. And uh, Pastor Cowan has produced a paper also, and I don't know if you have that available now, but worthwhile reading. Um, I myself have produced a history of the relationship between Israel and Palestine. It's a 24-page history, uh, covering history right up to the present time. I can make that available to you. I've been distributing it, but if you want to contact me at vernaffier at gmail.com, I'll get a copy to you. Uh, one of the things I found in talking about the situation in the Middle East with people uh, is that so many have said they knew almost nothing about the Middle East, uh, just not in their radar at all, and are surprised to hear what's going on when told. And that's one reason that I produce the history and am distributing it. So now we have arrived at the part of our service uh, today um, in which I'm inviting you to make an offering. Um, and this offering will go to the Des Moines uh, uh, Committee for Peace. Just let me say a couple of words about the Des Moines Pit, uh, Committee for Peace. It started back in the year 2002 when the United States was just about to launch an attack on Iraq. And a group of church people from different churches in the Des Moines area came together and they said, we need to hold an ecumenical service and pray for peace. And they did. That first ecumenical service was held in November of 2002, and it was held right here at St. John's Lutheran Church. That was the first service. And ever since then, uh, the Ecumenical Peace uh, Committee for Peace has been 
organizing and sponsoring three major events a, a year. Uh, one of them is the Feast of the Holy Innocents, which is held right after Christmas. Uh, today's Palm Sunday, a procession and worship service, and then in September, uh, we hold a service uh, for the, in the International Day of Peace. And of course, the committee incurs some expenses, operate on a budget, not a big budget, but appreciates any kind of help that can be received from you. It's not mandatory that you make a contribution, but if you can, that will be appreciated. And if you uh, donate by check, uh, please make it out to the Des Moines Faith Committee for Peace. That's the Des Moines Faith Committee for Peace. I haven't heard whether uh, how offerings will be taken or received. Can someone from the committee explain? Is there going to, are ushers going to do that? Okay, so you will be served by ushers who will come to you now. And as they do so, I invite you to join me in a word of prayer. Dear God, thank you for calling us into your service to work for peace and justice in your world. We remember, O oh Lord, the word you have spoken to us to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before you. We hear your call, O oh God, to turn our swords into plowshares and to remember the things that make for peace. Be our strength, Heavenly Father, as we seek for your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. I think at this time um, we will um, take part in the um, closing liturgy, and I need to bring the liturgy to me. I, I forgot to bring that forward. Could someone do that, please? Thank you. is found in the program, the last page. I ask you to join with me uh, by responding in the bold type. Our coming together today, as we are doing now, as people of God advocating for peace and justice, this is a vision of the way it can be the way it should be. Shouts of welcome, a joyful procession into the sanctuary of God, a community celebrating together. For this we hope, our whole being hopes in this promise. May we hold fast to God's vision of goodness, peace from the practice of justice, equality from the practice of respect. We wait with our whole being, watching and waiting for the morning. As this week unfolds, wait and watch for God's arrival. With God's arrival comes love. May we be overtaken by God's love. With God's arrival comes generous redemption. May we pour grace back into the world. With God's arrival, comes peace and shalom. May we actively seek it in every part of our lives. Go, friends, to embody the vision offered to us today, knowing that God hears our cries for peace in the world. Amen. We will continue with the singing of our sending hymn, O God of Every Nation, that is hymn number 713.
now invite you to receive the benediction. Let us go forth, brothers and sisters, knowing that God is with us, a light shining in the darkness. And may the Holy Spirit of peace, our constant companion, lead us along paths of solidarity and hope helping us to find the most loving, compassionate, and creative response. Until the sun of justice rises on a new day for all humanity, and may almighty God bless you in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>